coleslaw, mashed potatoes, and Kentucky Fried Chicken. Oh, enjoy! If you enjoy eating chicken, chances are you have stopped by a Kentucky Fried Chicken a couple of times in your life. With 22,600 outlets scattered across 135 countries around the world, it can be hard not to stumble upon one. Last year, KFC's system sales grew 6% worldwide, and the franchise has a brand value of a whopping $8.3 billion. Not bad for a company that originally started in a little gas station in North Corbin, Kentucky. The founder, Harlan Sanders, built the franchise with his own two greasy hands, and by doing so, he changed the world of fried chicken forever. And that at an age when people usually start thinking about retirement. The man's story is anything but usual. And it goes to show that sometimes going against the grain is exactly what you're supposed to do. Curious to find out how Harlan took his small rural gas station operation and turned it into one of the most successful fast food franchises in the world? Then make sure to keep watching this video. To explore how KFC came to be the billion-dollar franchise that it is today, we have to take a little trip back in time to Highway 25 in North Corbin, Kentucky. You see, before his face would beam over thousands of fried chicken joints, and he would be known more affectionately to billions across the globe as Colonel Sanders, Harlan Sanders had quite some work to do. After all, you don't receive the title of Colonel for nothing. If the only way to success is through failure, Harlan Sanders certainly earned his success. Harlan was born on September 9th in 1890, making him 12 years older than McDonald's founder Ray Kroc, who was born in 1902. He grew up in rural Indiana and had a pretty tough childhood. When he was just six years old, his father passed away suddenly from a fever, leaving his mother working several jobs to provide for him and his two siblings. Little Harlan became the cook of the house, and he was tasked with looking after his two younger siblings and taking care of the home. Needing to help provide for the family, he entered the workforce at the age of 10 as a farmhand making $2 a month. Today, this amounts to some $55 or 46 euros. Due to his unpleasant relationship with his stepfather, he left home when he was 12. And for the next three decades, his career was varied. At age 15, he was working on a streetcar, taking fares and making change. When he was 16, he forged some fake documents saying he was of age to enter the army. Not soon after, he got sent to Cuba, where he was honorably discharged after only three months. With such a short service, Harlan never became a military colonel. But little did he know, that title would come to him anyway later in life. After his army stint in Cuba, Harlan made his way to Alabama, and over the next 20 years plus, he worked a variety of jobs such as being a railroad worker, an insurance salesman, a country lawyer, a steamboat ferry operator, a tire salesman, and secretary to the Chamber of Commerce in Columbus, Indiana. For six years, he was the operator of a gas station, his longest tenured job, before it was closed due to the Great Depression. In 1930, Harlan was 40 years old, broke, and after having already failed several times in the workforce, he finally made his way to Corbin, Kentucky. There, Shell Oil Company agreed to allow him and his family to live at a recently built gas station. Harlan would own the gas station, and in exchange for the accommodation, a large percentage of sales was to be given back to Shell. Every Sunday night, he would cook his family a delicious meal, country ham, steak, and fried chicken. With hungry motorists passing through his station day and night asking him for dining recommendations, Harlan soon realized he should be the one providing them the food. He knew he could potentially earn some extra money if he would start serving the hungry travelers his family dinners. And that's how things got started. He advertised it as a Sunday dinner, seven days a week. And as you might expect, especially as fried chicken was a tremendous success. Of course, Harlan didn't have a restaurant. So at first, diners ate at his dining room table with his family. He called it home meal replacement. 
and he was selling complete meals to busy, traveling families. Soon enough, the word had spread and people from across the state came to visit solely for the delicious hearty dishes of steak, country ham, eggs, biscuits, and fried chicken. Eager to feed more customers than his kitchen table could handle, Harlan eventually bought out the motel across the street. He turned it into a 142-seat restaurant and moved his restaurant there. With more space and a growing demand, he also started toying with his fried chicken recipe. Soon enough, he had come across the now world-famous 11 herbs and spices and threw them into his fried chicken recipe. By now, people from all over the country found themselves lining up at the gas station to get a taste of the fried chicken Harland was cooking up. And life was looking quite rosy, but things were far from over. Business was booming, and orders for his chicken started piling up. But all of the extra demand left Harlan pining for a better way to make his chicken. While pan frying delivered tasty chicken, it took half an hour to make. And the other methods, such as baking and french frying, got him bad results. He knew he needed to find a way to cook faster to be able to meet the growing demand. But it was just as, or even more, important that the result would also be delicious. Luckily for him, one day he stumbled upon a tool that would allow him to do just that. At a local hardware store, he found a new interesting device, a pressure cooker. Retaining all the moisture and only needing a few minutes, the pressure cooker allowed him to further expand his business. And the device would change fried chicken forever. It didn't take long before his cafe became the go-to destination for people in search of a perfect piece of fried chicken. In 1935, the governor of Kentucky, Ruby Laffin, even bestowed Harlan the title of Colonel in recognition of his contributions to the state's cuisine. And from that point forward, he would be commonly called Colonel Sanders. But unfortunately, there were still some dark clouds ahead. And even after receiving the distinction, the Colonel still had trouble keeping his business afloat. The first trouble started in 1939, when just a couple of years into its growing success, Sanders Cafe was destroyed by a fire. The fire burnt down the entire restaurant, but Harland was not deterred. Instead, he rebuilt it and even added a motel onto his new restaurant. A year later, along with the new motor court, Sanders Court and Cafe was back on its feet and selling chicken like crazy to delighted travelers who were making their way on US-25, a major north-south route in America. Harlan was so well-liked and well-respected that when he lost his official colonel certificate, the state and governor, Lawrence Weatherby, just decided to recommission him in 1950. So in truth, he was a colonel twice over. Things were going great again until the route of the new interstate was announced. Unfortunately, unlike US-25, the interstate did not swing by Sanders Court and Cafe. And due to the new highway bypassing his cafe, his place quickly became an off-the-beaten-path destination instead of the main attraction. Colonel Sanders was once again out of luck, but not one to chicken out easily, pun intended. He decided to take matters into his own hands. While he knew the new highway would likely doom his tiny eatery, he still had faith in the chicken business. And he also realized that his future wasn't tied to one restaurant and that he could instead have many of them selling his chicken at the same time. So in 1952, at the age of 62, he sold his restaurant and motor court and hit the road with his recipe and pressure cooker. Approaching retirement with little in the bank, Harlan had created a last ditch plan to produce some retirement income. He drove from diner to diner, pleading with owners to use his delicious 11 secret herbs and spices chicken recipe. All they had to do in return was give him a nickel commission on each piece sold. In the meantime, the colonel slept in his car and was nearly broke again. That same year, Peter Harmon, the owner of Dew Drop Inn in Salt Lake City, became the first to accept his offer. And with nothing more than a handshake agreement, Salt Lake City became the first city with a Kentucky Fried Chicken franchise. 
By 1959, he had made over 200 such deals in the United States and Canada. And by now, Colonel Sanders was finally a permanent success. It was also around this time when he began dressing the part too. And from the late 1950s until his death in 1980, he always wore a white suit, a black string bow tie, and a snow white goatee. It was said he had two suits, a heavy wool one for winter and a light cotton one for summer. In 1964, Harlan sold his Kentucky Fried Chicken Company for $2 million. Today, that would be around $15 million. However, despite selling, he stayed on as a spokesman in the face of Kentucky Fried Chicken until his death in 1980. For the rest of his life, he traveled across the country and the world talking about chicken. But although he kept working as a spokesperson, he was not pleased at all with the taste of his famous chicken and gravy. He would visit KFCs across the country, criticizing the low quality of the food, saying the gravy was horrible and that the extra crispy recipe was nothing more than a damn fried dough ball stuck on a chicken. And he wasn't going to be silent about his critical opinions either. In some interviews, he was so upset by the quality of the food that he would tell reporters that the gravy ain't fit for my dogs. And in fact, he was so open about his disdain for the alterations made to his signature recipes that KFC even sued him for libel in 1978. While it was at one point having a pretty miserable decade in America, today, KFC is doing well. As the franchise grew rapidly overseas, particularly in China, it started losing more and more customers back home. Competitors were flaunting nicer restaurants, tastier chicken, and more persuasive marketing. And not to mention that fast food giant McDonald's and the other burger chains also sell a lot of crispy chicken, sandwiches, and nuggets nowadays. But in 2015, the fried chicken franchise began a mission to reclaim its fried chicken empire with a U.S. turnaround plan. The plan included store renovations, staff training, and a summer advertising campaign featuring Daryl Hammond as Colonel Sanders. White suit, black tie, and all. Today, the company keeps the stunts and campaigns coming to regain relevance and stay top of mind with its customers. And it is safe to say that learning to take marketing risks has paid off well for the franchise. For anyone who is tired of hearing impressive tales of visionary young CEOs, this was the story of an old man's journey to discover his greatest talent. Colonel Sanders started his big business at the age of 66, but he had a talent and a unique recipe. And after many less profitable ventures, it wasn't until he was nearing retirement age that he tried a novel business model that would soon transform American commerce, franchising. This allowed him to convert his little cafe into a multi-billion dollar franchise that is still booming today. We hope that you've been inspired. Do you have a business in mind that you would like us to cover in the future? Then share it in the comments and make sure to take a look at our channel for more inspiring stories.